Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, the topic that we will be covering is the Every Student Succeeds Act, specifically provisions regarding homeless children and youth and their implications for students with disabilities. My name is Patricia Julianell. I'm the Director of State Projects and Legal Affairs for the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth, also known as NACI. Um, I have worked with uh, the educational needs of students with disabilities, representing parents of children with disabilities in the court system as well as privately. And for the past 15 years or so, I've been focusing on the rights of children and youth experiencing homelessness. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us at NACI to reach out to people working with students with disabilities and provide some information that hopefully will be helpful to you in your advocacy. Just a quick background on NACI. We are a national membership association dedicated to educational excellence for children and youth experiencing homelessness. Most of our members are professionals working in school districts or state departments of education, as well as advocates, service providers, uh, and young people. We do work on educational issues from early childhood all the way up through higher education. We provide technical assistance on policy implementation. Um, and we do have a very strong emphasis on making sure that we have youth leadership and youth voice in all of the work that we undertake. As I mentioned, today we're going to focus specifically on students experiencing homelessness with an emphasis on those who have disabilities. To give you a little context, in the 2013-14 school year, public schools identified over 1.3 million children and youth experiencing homelessness. That was a 7% increase over the previous year. And if we go back to the beginning of the recession in 2007, we have seen a 100% increase in the number of students experiencing homelessness. So this obviously has had a significant impact on children and families and on school districts. In addition, as we see the percentage of students experiencing homelessness increase, we are seeing that they are now an increasing percentage of students overall in school districts around the country. So if we look at those children who are extremely poor, and that is a census designation, extremely poor, almost a third of those students are experiencing homelessness. So this is having a very significant impact on schools around the country as they serve children in poverty. Now for students experiencing homelessness with disabilities, that increase has been actually the most significant of all the subgroups. As you can see on this slide, uh, schools do report their homelessness data according to various subgroups, including young people experiencing homelessness on their own, migrant students, uh, those who are English learners, and also children with disabilities. And as you can see from the 2012-13 to the 2013-14 school year, there was a 15% increase in students identified as experiencing homelessness and also having disabilities identified uh, under the IDEA Individuals with Disabilities Education Act process. If you'd like to take a look at that data for your particular state, you can access the website at the very bottom of the slide. That is the website for the National Center for Homeless Education, and that is the U.S. Department of Education's Federal Technical Assistance Center on the Education of Homeless Children and Youth. On that slide, you can look at data for each individual state in the United States disaggregated by disability status, and you can see what that data looks like in your state. We know that there are good reasons why there's a significant overlap between children youth experiencing homelessness and those with disabilities. The impacts of homelessness on children are such that they can increase the incidence of disabilities uh, not only those that are served through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, but also those that would receive services through Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So for example, we know that children experiencing homelessness have higher incidences of acute and chronic illnesses, of depression, of anxiety. Uh, you can imagine what it's like to be a child trying to sit through school and pay attention in class, but not knowing will you'll be sleeping that night where or if you'll be eating that night, and the kind of emotional stressors that come with that. 
Homelessness among young children is associated with poor classroom engagement later in life in elementary school as well as poor social skills. And young people who experience homelessness are 87% more likely to drop out of school. That was a study that came out a couple of years ago. And the correlation between homelessness and dropping out of high school actually was higher than the correlation between dropping out and any of the other risk factors that were looked at in the study, including being in foster care, experiencing incarceration, and other risk factors. So we know that homelessness can lead children to drop out of school. And when you combine homelessness with having a disability, the challenges are very, very significant. Now that's where the McKinney-Vento Act comes in. The McKinney-Vento Act is one small portion of the Every Student Succeeds Act. McKinney-Vento actually was originally passed back in 1987. It's gone through various iterations since then, the latest one being in the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was just passed in December. The McKinney-Vento Act is Title IX, Part A of the Every Student Succeeds Act, and it is the federal law regarding how schools should serve students experiencing homelessness. There are implementers of the McKinney-Vento Act at the state level in every state, and those folks are called state coordinators. Every state must designate a state coordinator who can sufficiently carry out their duties. And let me pause for a moment to let you know that as we go through the following slides, you'll see that there are some words in blue and some words in red. The words in red signify changes that were recently made by the Every Student Succeeds Act. So whether you have experience with McKinney event or not, as you go through the slides, you'll be able to notice what's new and what is something that's been in the law for at least the past 10 to 15 years, if not longer. So on this slide, you can see that it is new language that state coordinators must be able to sufficiently carry out their duties. In other words, each state needs to make sure that their state coordinator has adequate time, training, and authority to implement the act statewide. State coordinators also monitor local educational agencies' compliance with the act. Local educational agencies, if you're not aware, are generally considered to be school districts. However, they often also are county offices of education, um, offices that provide special education services, education service centers, and charter schools. So state coordinators are monitoring compliance with the McKinney-Vento Act. They are providing information on the state website about how many students are experiencing homelessness in that state, and also who people can contact on the local level for assistance with students experiencing homelessness. State coordinators need to respond to inquiries that come in from the field from homeless parents and unaccompanied youth related to their rights and making sure that they receive the protections that they deserve under the law. And state coordinators also must provide training. So they are required to develop and implement professional development programs for liaisons. And we're going to speak in just a minute about who those liaisons are. And also for other school district personnel. And that training is designed to make sure that they can identify who actually is eligible in their school district for McKinney Dental Protection, as well as making sure they're aware of the specific needs of children and youth experiencing homelessness. And that would include the specific needs of children and youth with disabilities who are in homeless situations. Now let's get to those local liaisons. Uh, that is a word that you've seen on a couple of slides, and that's actually the word that the law uses to describe the professionals at the local school districts who are in charge of implementing the McKinney-Vento Act. So you'll see on the slide that every LEA, or local education agency, must designate a McKinney-Vento liaison who is able to carry out his or her legal duties. So like the state coordinator, the liaison must have adequate time and capacity to be able to make sure that students experience homelessness to receive the protections that they are entitled to under the law. As you can see from the slide, liaisons must ensure that mckinney Vento students can enroll in school, that they have the opportunity to succeed in school, to ensure that children in in homeless situations are identified by school personnel. Obviously, if we don't know who those students are, we can't make sure that they receive their mckinney Vento duties. So identification for children in in homeless situations is very important. And many school districts actually combine their McKinney-Vento identification efforts with some of their child fine activities under IDEA, so that when they're doing child fine activities, at the same time they're providing information about McKinney-Vento and about students who are homeless 
so that when there are children and families who actually are in both situations, they can get information about both of those laws and the rights uh, that they have under both of those laws. That also connects to the last bullet on the slide that liaisons must post public notice of making event rights and make sure that that information is out there in areas where parents, guardians, and other companies youth can find the information. So for example, having information about making event rights in parent training and information centers would be a great place to make sure that families are able to get the information and even share it with uh, their neighbors and with other families they might know. Liaisons also have to ensure that other school personnel receive training on the McKinney Vento Act. So obviously folks who work with special education, school psychologists, teachers, paraprofessionals, others within the school setting that they're aware of the McKinney Vento Act so that they can be supporting students experiencing homelessness. Liaisons must ensure that young children can access early childhood education services. And specifically, with the Every Student Succeeds Act, early intervention programs under IDEA Part C are now listed among those services that liaisons must provide referrals to for young children who might meet those eligibility requirements. And, and very many young children experiencing homelessness um, certainly are at least at risk of a developmental delay or a condition likely to result in, in a developmental delay that would make them eligible for those Part C early intervention services. In addition, liaisons must ensure, uh, ensure that children youth, and families receive referrals to other services they may need, such as health care, dental care, mental health, substance abuse, and housing. Now, in terms of who is covered by the McKinney Vento Act, I've used the term homeless quite a few times through the presentation. There is a specific definition of homelessness in the McKinney Vento Act. It includes children who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And there are several subcategories that are specifically covered. So the first and most important one is children and youth who are sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. And you can see that that's three quarters of the students that schools across the country are identifying and serving in the McKinney Mento. As homelessness has increased over the past decade or so, services for homeless families and children have not increased. And so there simply are not enough shelters around the country to house all of the families and youth who need shelter. So when we're looking at McKinney Vento students, we're really looking far beyond the traditional shelter or living in a car or living on the street or what we might stereotypically think of when we think of homelessness. We're really looking at families who have lost their housing, they've been evicted, they've lost a job, and they don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have the economic means to land in another apartment or another house. So they end up staying on a couch or in a living room of a family member, someone from their church, a neighbor, or often a complete stranger. That's the largest and most significant category of homeless families that our schools are serving. In addition to those children and youth, schools are also identifying and serving children and youth who are living in motels, trailer parks, or campgrounds due to the lack of adequate alternative accommodations. So again, a family who's living in a trailer park and their mobile home is perfectly adequate. It's got running water, heat, electricity, a roof. Uh, we certainly know that many families live in mobile home parks that are completely adequate. They would not be considered to be in the kindergarten of students. We're looking at the, the adequacy of those arrangements. Other categories of eligibility are somewhat more commonly recognized. Children and youth living in emergency or transitional shelters, living in a public or private place not designed for living, living in a car, abandoned building, bus or train station, etc. And any students who are migrant students who are also living in those situations also would be eligible for making mental services. The last category of eligibility we want to talk about is unaccompanied homeless youth. Those are child, children or youth who meet that McKinney Vento definition of homeless that I just went over on the previous slide but are not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. So we see an accompanied youth in a variety of circumstances, for example, when parents are deceased or incarcerated, or the family simply has had to split up just due to trying to find housing and being homeless and finding a relative, for example, who can take some of the family but not the whole family. But more often for an accompanied youth, what we're seeing are young people who've been forced out of their homes due to some kind of severe family dysfunction 
um, such as being rejected due to their sexual orientation or due to pregnancy or simply fleeing abuse and neglect, illegal behavior, et cetera, that's occurring in the home. So this is another category of homeless students that we've seen increasing over the years um, and that does have an overlap with children and youth with disabilities. And we'll talk a little bit later about a specific resource that just came out to try to help school districts serve unaccompanied homeless youth with disabilities. Well, now that we've talked about the who of McKinney Vento, who is implementing it, and who is covered by it, I do want to talk quickly about what the law actually provides and what are some of the rights that students experiencing homelessness have, and in particular, how those can benefit children and youth with disabilities. The first thing we want to talk about is school stability. And the McKinney Vento Act provides that every local education agency or school district must look at each student's best interest and either allow that student to continue in their school of origin for as long as they're homeless, and also once they find permanent housing, to be able to continue until the end of that academic year in their school of origin, or to enroll that student in any public school that house students living in the same area where the student is actually living are eligible to attend. So let's break that down a little bit further. When we're looking at school stability, this issue does apply no matter when students lose their housing, whether it's during the school year or during the summer. And the definition of school of origin is really designed to follow the student as they may be moving around during homelessness. So school of origin is defined as the school they attended when the child was permanently housed or the school in which last enrolled. And the school of origin also includes a preschool. That is a new change from the Every Student Succeeds Act that young children in preschool now are able to remain in the same preschool even if they're moving around due to their homelessness, even if they're moving to a different school district due to their homelessness. They can stay in that preschool as long as that is in their best interest to do so. The definition of school of origin also was recently changed to include the designated receiving school in a feeder school pattern. So for example, if a student is in an elementary school that goes into sixth grade, that student completes the sixth grade and is going to move into seventh grade into a junior high school. If there is a feeder school pattern in that school district, so that, for example, all children from McKinney Elementary School automatically feed into Vento Junior High, children experiencing homelessness also would be able to follow that feeder school pattern from their elementary school up into their junior high school or from junior high to high school, again, as long as that is in their best interest. So let's take a look at what that best interest really means in the McKinney Vento Act. McKinney Vento states specifically that when we look at best interest, we want to always presume that keeping the student stable in the same school is in the ch child's best interest. We know that school stability is extremely important for children experiencing homelessness, and particularly for children with disabilities, that stability of staying in the same place with their same IEP, their same services, the same professionals providing those services, the same teachers, that can make an extremely important difference for students as they advance from grade to grade, as we look at academic achievement and their ability to uh, um, be emotionally stable, mentally stable, and not have that disruption in their education. For students experiencing homelessness, school is often the only stable thing in their lives. So we are going to presume that keeping students in the school of origin are in the student's best, is in the student's best interest. But we're also going to look at student-centered factors, the impact of mobility on achievement, education, health, and safety. There may be situations where, for example, the commute is simply going to be too long or too unsafe for a student. And that certainly would be an aspect we'd want to look at when we're looking at students with physical disabilities and other disabilities. How will that commute impact them? And perhaps there may be other factors that really might indicate that staying in the school of origin is not in that student's best interest. McKinney Vento requires the school district to give priority to the parents' request and also if we're working with an unaccompanied youth to give priority to that unaccompanied youth request. In terms of transportation, school districts are required to provide transportation to the school of origin for students experiencing homelessness and that includes until the end of the academic year if they are going to be uh, staying in their school of origin through the end of the academic year after finding permanent housing. 
So some students with disabilities also will have transportation on their IEP. They may not, but regardless of that fact, for McKinney Vento students, they do automatically get transportation to and from their school of origin. Now we also need to talk about immediate enrollment. As I mentioned, there certainly will be cases where staying in the school of origin is not in the student's best interest. And we need to make sure that student is immediately enrolled in a local school. Immediate enrollment, of course, is very important for all students, but for students with disabilities uh, to avoid any disruption or interruption in their services, immediate enrollment is critical. And the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act also has its own provisions regarding immediate enrollment and implementation of the student's pre-existing IEP in a new school district right away so that the school district is providing services comparable to what's in that IEP. So those IDEA provisions overlap with the McKinney Vento provisions to provide educational stability for students experiencing homelessness with disabilities. As you can see on the slide, for McKinney Vento students, as I said, that enrollment does need to be immediate. And that is true even if the students are missing documents that are typically required for uh, school enrollment. That would include school records, including IEPs and special education documents, as well as health records, proof of residency. And if students have missed any application deadlines during a period of homelessness, this is particularly relevant if we're looking at charter schools or other education programs that may have rolling deadlines. Um, those deadlines do need to be waived for students experiencing homelessness. The term enroll is actually defined in the McKinney-Vento Act as attending classes and participating fully in school activities. So again, this means really being part of the school and getting all the services that the student's entitled to, whether that be through an IEP or through some other education program. And both states and school districts must develop, review, and revise their policies to remove barriers to the identification enrollment and retention of children in homeless situations, including barriers due to outstanding fees, fines, or absences. So we're really looking at systemic policies to avoid barriers to enrollment, to avoid delays in enrollment, to ensure that enrollment and participation can be immediate. Just a couple of more slides about McKinney-Vento in terms of support for academic success trying to make sure that full participation is immediate. There is a requirement for states to have procedures to eliminate barriers to academic activities and also extracurricular activities. So that would include sports, clubs, and other school activities beyond the curriculum. And also to ensure that students have immediate access to other programs like magnet schools, career and technical education, summer school, online learning, et cetera, as well as partial credit. We know that students who move around a lot, particularly at the high school level, often have challenges accruing credits. So the McKinney-Vento Act does require states to have policies and procedures in place allowing students to accrue credits, even if they're only in a particular school for two weeks or two months, for that school to calculate how much credit can they get for the period of time they were there, to award that credit, and then pass that on to a subsequent school district. So even if students are moving around, they can put together partial credits and continue to advance towards graduation. Lastly, the McKinney-Vento Act does require coordination with other laws and programs. So for example, school districts must coordinate their McKinney-Vento and special education services within that school district and also with other school districts if the student is crossing district lines. So again, when we're working with students who are experiencing homelessness, and also have special needs that those two departments within the school district are working together, coordinating services, and making sure the student's getting what he or she needs under both of those programs. There also are requirements to keep information about a student's living situation confidential, so that information is subject to FERPA. And there also is a new provision trying to help students experiencing homelessness access homeless assistance services provided by the Department of Housing and Urban Development so that liaisons can establish a student's eligibility for those programs. And we do expect to see additional guidance coming out this summer from the Department of Education and the Department of Housing and Urban Development on that provision. 
that concludes the substantive information that I wanted to present you with today, but I do want to make sure you're aware of some resources that are available to you. Uh, we have our website at the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth where we have uh, a lot of information about the Every Student Succeeds Act, about new changes to Mickey Evento. We also have some information, again, about the overlap between homelessness and students with special needs. So you can get all of that on our website. And you can also see some additional websites on this slide as well as on subsequent slides. If you uh, download this PowerPoint presentation from the website, all of those links are clickable for you. So you can look at the resources, just click on the link, and get all the information that you need to follow up and to continue to learn more on this subject, including some resources that are very specifically dedicated to that overlap between students with special needs and those experiencing homelessness. And here also you can see that resource I mentioned earlier specifically designed to help make sure that unaccompanied youth with disabilities can receive the services that they need. So with that, I thank you for joining us today. You're certainly welcome to contact Macy at any time with any questions that you might have. And we really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you.